Thank you everybody for being here. I'm very happy to be here with Dr. Thomas Herr. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. And I just wanna say though to everyone who's watching this, this is a channel all about psychology and we've been particularly focused on the topic of intelligence. And we've been doing this thorough series on the multiple intelligences theory. And the initial you know, theorist to come up with this, Dr. Howard Gardner, directly recommended Dr. Thomas Herr to me um, for an interview. So I'm here with Dr. Thomas Herr, who has significant experience applying the multiple intelligences theory in the world. So will you go ahead and share about your experiences? Sure. Sure, Nick. First of all, thanks for having me on. Uh, more importantly, thanks for formally looking at addressing the issue of intelligence. <clears throat> um, by way of background, I'm an educator. I'm here probably, not probably, I'm here because I ran the New City School in St. Louis for 34 years. I came there in 1981, and in 1988, we came upon Howard Gardner's book, Trains of Mind. And when I read it, I was struck with the fact that what Gardner was really saying is that everybody has talents. It's not simply a black and white. And I read the book and thought, wow, there's really a, an opportunity for us here. So I convened a group of teachers at the New City School, about 13 of them. And we met over the summer and we read the book. We called ourselves the Talent Committee. I felt it was a bit presumptuous to call ourselves the Intelligence Committee. <laughs> and uh, we went chapter by chapter. And in retrospect, we really did it the right way because different people took responsibility for different chapters. And if you were leading us with a chapter, you used that intelligence. Mm -hmm. So when we read about the musical intelligence, we did it musically. When we read about the logical mathematical intelligence, we did it through puzzles. So again, we implemented MI in 1988. We were the second school in the country to do that. The key school led by Pat Bolanos at the time in Indianapolis was the first school. I retired six years ago, and MI was still a big, big part of we, who we are. Uh, since my retirement, I'm now working for the University of Missouri St. Louis in the Ed Leadership Program, and I'm preparing prospective principals, prospective cool, school leaders, working with school leaders. And not surprisingly, the, the whole notion of, of MI fits even there, because what MI is most of all, from my perspective as an educator, is an opportunity to give kids no more ways to learn. And it's hard to argue with that. Mm. Yeah, what great work. So one of the first things I'm, I'm curious about is if you can kind of paint a picture of what it looks and feels like in the school, on campus. What is the culture of New City School and how do you, how can you kind of recognize that the multiple intelligences theory is informing the curriculum? Great. Well, let me, let me put it in context. And the first thing I would say is that when people walk in the doors of the school, the red doors, we've got red doors, um, they're often immediately struck by the culture, how it feels. One of the things that I like to talk about is the smile quotient of a school. In my work at University of Missouri St. Louis, I go to 20, 25 schools a year and I'll walk in grade schools, high schools. And if, if your viewers have been in a school lately, if they're a parent or if they're an educator, they'll know exactly to what I'm referring. When you walk in a school, within the first 30 seconds, you can feel it, you can feel the ambience. And I talk about the smile quotient, and my bias is that when you walk in a school, it should feel joyful. It should be very clear that everybody wants to be there, the kids and the adults. That doesn't mean that they're not lurking, working. It doesn't mean that it's all playtime but it means it's a place where we can grow. And if we can grow and learn, we're gonna be happy. At the New City School, if you went around and you visited classrooms, what you would see are lots of opportunities for kids to use multiple intelligences. Now the reality is, and we back up again and talk about MI, and I know you've had other shows on this, Gardner uh, initially said there were seven intelligences, linguistic, logical, mathematical, spatial, music, probably kinesthetic, and then intrapersonal and intrapersonal. He later added an eighth, the naturalist. When I've written about 
at, at MI and a number of books. Um, I talk about the linguistic and the logical mathematical as the scholastic intelligences. Those are the intelligences that schools embrace. Uh, if kids are strong in those intelligences, we say they're smart. If they struggle, we say, well, she's got a problem. Uh, he's not learning well. In fact, life is a whole lot more than the scholastic intelligences. I'm working now on, on a different but related area and writing a lot about empathy, about social emotional learning. Um, had a book that came out in January called Taking Social Emotional Learning School Wide. And in it, I talked about the formative five. And my, my catchword phrase for that is who you are is more important than what you know. Let me say that again. Who you are is more important than what you know. And that ties directly into MI because the way we implemented it, we value all of the intelligences, but we believe that the personal intelligence is interpersonal, knowing, uh, understanding, reading of the people, and intrapersonal, knowing yourself, are the most important intelligences. So you would see looks of that as you walk around. You would see kids working in teams. You'd see kids working individually. If you walked in a first grade room, walked in any of my rooms, you would not see kids sitting in rows at desks in kind of a rigid line. You'd see desks, you'd see tables, you'd see kids working collaboratively. Many times, and I think this is a good thing, you'd walk in a room and you wouldn't really know where the teacher was because he or she might be on the floor with kids, might be in a corner working with somebody. Rarely would you see that teacher in front pacificating and lecturing to kids. There is a place for that, but it's not a big place, I would argue. Uh, a couple specific examples. In our fifth grade, these would be kids 10 and 11 years old. We looked at um, colonial America, civil war, and civil rights. And typically, the way that fifth graders would look at that is they would read about it and they'd write about it. And what happens is uh, kids like you, Nick, these strong scholastic ones, the ones who are linguistically, logically, mathematically talented, they would do well. Other kids might not do as well. So what our teacher said is, hold on a second, how can we use MI to help kids learn? So a couple things happened. One is I walked by a classroom one day, and there were kids who were depicting the history of the Civil War. What they did, though, is they had a huge piece of paper, horizontal line down the middle, north above, south below, and they were drawing incidents, actions that happened in the Civil War that led up to it, happened in it, and then happened subsequently. And so what was happening now is kids who were spatially talented, kids who were good drawers, all of a sudden were able to really get their, their play in it. Mm. Um, kids who were logically mathematical were able to do that. It also had kids working in teams. So that was a wonderful activity. So that's another way of saying, let's capture what brought us to the Civil War, what happened, and subsequently, rather than simply reading and writing. Another time I was in a class, fifth grade class again, and they were looking at the issue of slavery. And it's too easy, I think, uh, to simply say slavery is terrible, it was, and move on. Well, let's step back. What caused that? What were the antecedents? To what degree did uh, topography have a role in the Civil War? So what class did after studying it, is the kids broke up into groups and the teachers gave kids cards, they just drew them, and they had to develop a five minute play, they had to develop the script, and one character was a slave, one was a slave owner, one was a merchant, one was a Quaker, one was a politician, and they rotated, so all kids played all roles. And what these children were doing then was formulating the text, the narrative that supported the positions they were holding. So that was a way of really showing whether they understood the Civil War. One more example, uh, and then I'll stop. I could spend the whole hour giving examples. Our fourth grade did a big unit on biographies, autobiographies, biographies. And most fourth graders do that. I give presentations around the world. And when I tell the story, I say, who teaches fourth grade? And hands go up. And I say, do you do biographies? Everybody does it. It's in the fourth grade teacher gene pool. Well, the way they typically do it is kids pick a character, they read about that person, they write about that person. And again, if you're strong scholastically, you do well on biographies. If writing isn't your thing, well, you really didn't get it. So let me stop you for a second, and already you can see the trajectory. You can see the kids who maybe aren't particularly talented in scholastic intelligences 
by fourth and fifth grade, they've gotten the message that they're not a good student. And then we wonder why these kids lose enthusiasm, why they don't do as well at school. None of us, including me, including you, want to do well, want to do things at which we don't do well. So our, our challenge is to provide opportunities for kids to learn. They're rigorous and get the content and yet can also be enjoyable. And having said that, kids very, need to learn how to read, write, and calculate. Absolutely. We gave standardized tests. Um, kids cannot find success normally by dancing their way through life. So they do need to learn that, but we give these other avenues. So coming back to the biographies, one of my favorite days would be in January, and I'd walk in the library, and it was the Living Museum. And what happened, we would have probably 90 fourth graders in the school. Every fourth grader had picked somebody that they wanted to study. They had read that person, so they knew his or her life. And then they became that person. So when you walked in the library, There'd be one of those plastic milk cartons and the kids standing on it, frozen in pose, dressed like um, Martin Luther King, dressed like Jackie Robinson, dressed like Albert Einstein, dressed like uh, Florence Nightingale, whatever. The kid's frozen and you walk up and there's a little button and you press the button and the kid springs to life and looks at you and says, hi, I'm John Kennedy. I was born in and begin to tell you his life. And at the end, John Kennedy says to you, what questions do you have? Um, what would you like to know? Well, what comes out of that, first of all, is these kids, these fourth graders, they all get the notion of biography. They know how biography is different than autobiography. They certainly learned about the person that they became. But now what's happened is all 90 of them have succeeded. They've all gotten excited. They want to come to school as opposed to a very narrow traditional definition of intelligence, which divides kids into those who write well and those who don't. So the Living Museum uh, was one of my favorite days. Last thing, I said this was the last one, but I give, gotta give you one more. Keep so it coming. In kindergarten, uh, they study the human body and they study the human body as kindergartners. People sometimes say, well, they can't read and write. Well, no, they can't, but they can build and they can assemble. Kids would build a life-size functioning human body. Now, it's their life size, so it's not as tall as you or I, um, but they use popsicle sticks for ribs. They use red yarn and white yarn to show the difference between veins and arteries. Um, they've got yarn for hair, color of their hair. And when I say it functions, what they will do is have a juice box for the heart, and they'll have plastic bags for our lungs. They've got an esophagus. So when you, when you squeeze that heart, the lungs actually inflate. And what we have is a busybody breakfast. And these are kindergartners. So kindergarten moms, dads, caregivers come to school and the kids stand holding their busy body their size. And they explain what the various systems of the body are, how it works, and they show. So once again, we've got all kinds of different developmentally ready kindergartners, some who can read, some who still are having trouble with alphabet, but they've all successfully assembled this human body talk about joyful learning. They love coming to school. They love learning. So those are some ways in which multiple intelligences came alive at my school and provided not only opportunities for kids to learn and grow, but opportunities for teachers to learn and grow. The teachers, if you had them all here, they would say they loved using MI. They would roll their eyes because it's hard. It takes more time. Uh, you've got to have creativity. You've got to work as part of a team. But at the end of the day, they went home knowing that they had made a difference in kids' lives, and that's why they went into teaching. Mm, gosh, beautiful. Like such clear, concrete examples um, of multiple intelligences in the classroom. I really, I'm in personally deeply inspired by it, especially just to share a personal note. You know, my, my wife and I sort of quasi homeschool our son. I say quasi because it's not what many people think of as homeschooling, but we definitely do a um, uniquely tailored schooling approach for our child. And we, we work with a group of a, a bunch of amazing parents who are taking the same approach and we do it together. And just, you're giving me great ideas for how to help these kids, you know, develop multiple intelligences and along with developing in various ways and not just scholastically. I, I think that it can't be emphasized enough just how important this is for a child's confidence and self-esteem 
And I can only imagine how much the smile quotient is improved by the fact that kids with skill sets outside the scholastic ones are really getting a chance to shine and be celebrated. Absolutely. And I, I just think that's like, there's the quote, I, I imagine you have probably heard it by Albert Einstein, which is, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. Right. And I think, you know, what you're describing is just providing water for all the fish in the world, providing environments that really enable kids to flourish. And honestly, I also think kind of on the flip side, that it's very healthy for the kids who are scholastically very advanced to struggle with drawing, for example, and to see that, wow, that kid's way better than me at oh. drawing. Because I think in the typical traditional school model, um, the kids with scholastic achievement are almost unspokenly given the message, you're better than them. Those kids who are struggling, you're better. When, of course, one of those kids who's struggling with writing might be a brilliant artist or musician. And so that, that humbling factor of remembering, like, I'm not the best at everything is really healthy, I think, as well, and, and grounding for kids who are advanced scholastically. To totally. And let me, let me jump off, if I may, and, and kind of give you two other related pieces to that. Um, as in any good school, or as, let me back up, as in any school, the quality of education is only as good as the quality of its teachers. And in a good school, you've got really good teachers. And that was the case at the New City School. I was really fortunate to work with these folks. And as good as they would be at any school, I think they were actually better at New City because we tapped into their creativity. We allowed them to come, become people who designed curriculum. We also talk a lot about the notion of collegiality. If educators are listening to this, there's a wonderful book by Roland Barth called Improving Schools from Within. And Barth's thesis, B-A-R-T-H, which I talk about a lot in my teaching at the University of Missouri St. Louis, is that if children are grow and learn, the adults must grow and learn too. So part of my job- Can you say that one more time for me? Sure. If children are to grow and learn, the adults must grow and learn too. Hmm. And so part of my job as the head of school was creating an environment in which everybody grows, including me. All of us have to grow. And so what that meant was creating opportunities for teachers to grow and learn with one another. Uh, schools are remarkably silo-like. Uh, there can be two teachers, wonderful teachers, teaching in adjacent rooms, and it's amazing how little they share, or two third grade teachers. And we really tried to work against that. So I would suggest that collegiality is a really important factor in multiple intelligences. Uh, actually, in any school, that needs to be there, but particularly with MI. And then the, the second vein that I would run with as I said earlier, that we believe that the personal intelligences are the most important. And so if you were a parent, if you are a parent at New City School, we brought that into, pro, pray, into play with the whole notion of what you measure is what you value. Our report card, whether your child was three years old or sixth grade, that was where we ended, began with looking at the personal intelligences. We began with intrapersonal and interpersonal. Mm -hmm. So every parent-teacher conference we didn't begin by talking about reading math language. And then at the end, as we were running out of time, talk about what kind of a child uh, your young human being was. Rather, we began by talking about confidence, motivation, teamwork, effort, appreciation for diversity. Those were the issues that we began discussing. And then we moved to the scholastics. Now that was again, going back in 1988. It's now a few years later, and I've been working a whole lot on social emotional learning. And I got into that, you used the word grit not too long ago. And I think my work on SEL, I'm writing a lot about empathy now, is directly an outgrowth of our work with the personal intelligences. When I was at New City, at the end there, I really got into grit. And one of the comments I made is that, coming back to your point about the talented kids who need to learn how to struggle, too often in schools we get high flyers, kids who are always doing well. Um, we typically worry about the kids who are struggling, as we should. Uh, we worry about the kids who are in the middle, as we should. But too often, we don't worry about the high flyers. They're doing fine. And I would argue that's a real mistake. that We have an obligation with those high flyers, too. And the way I put it 
pretty starkly is that we need to help every child prepare how to deal with frustration and failure. And what that means is if a kid is doing well at everything, and you get those kids, uh, they do well at every academic subject, they're great artists, they're on the lacrosse team, they've got the lead in school play, they're in student council. If we get those kids, we as educators have to work to find a way for that kid to hit the wall so that we can teach her how to pick herself up and move forward. Um, I don't know you well, but I can see you and I know that you're old enough already that you know that none of us get through life only succeeding if we take challenges. What that means is at some point in your life, sooner or later, often, many laters, you're going to hit the wall. And success isn't determined by not failing, by avoiding that. Success is determined by how well you pick yourself up, by your grit, by your tenacity. Uh, parenthetically, it's also determined by your empathy. That's another question. But to come back to the grit, that was one of the things we focused on. And MI was helpful there, too, because as you said, we would have some kids who did well these things, some kids who did well with those things. And what that meant was during the course of the school year, month, week, teachers would sometimes assign kids to particular intelligence. And sometimes kids could choose. Well, if you choose, you're going to choose your strongest one. But sometimes teachers would assign them. And what that meant was the kid who's really a good writer has to do art. The kid who's really a great artist has to do math and work on it in a creative kind of a way. So I think what happened is when our kids graduated from New City after grade six, they had a very different kind of educational experience. Joyful learning, as we said earlier, was part of the norm because we allowed them to use their strengths in learning. And I, I think that that's the way it should be everywhere. Mm, yeah, this is, this is really interesting. One of the things that's coming to mind just now, based on what you said is, how you can use their strengths to learn even the subjects that are outside of their strengths. That's, that's really interesting to me. And I think, yeah, like the history example of, of drawing what happened or the example of the live museum where you're embodying the individual, those might be, yeah, good, great examples of using the intelligences that do come naturally to a child to help develop the other intelligences that don't come as naturally. It's sort of a mode of learning along with a way of being intelligent. That's interesting. Yeah, that's One of the cool. other just reflections I'm having is just about, about that point of the kind of very well-rounded, generally advanced student um, who doesn't struggle enough. It's a great point, really. And, you know, I think that one of the great challenges as a teacher I know as being one is finding this sort of collective zone of proximal development, this collective sweet spot of learning where it's not too challenging and not too easy. And the tricky thing is that that's really different for different individuals and in every subject, it's different for each individual. So to find that is just quite difficult. And sometimes it, the, I hate to put it this way, but it's sort of the lowest common denominator somewhat dictates how the subjects are being taught. And then there's a group of people who just aren't challenged enough. So yeah, that's, this is helpful in even personally as a teacher to help figure out how to better find that and help people personalize their learning process. And on this note of personalizing the learning process, you mentioned earlier what I think is absolutely true that we all need to reach this sort of base level for each of the intelligences. We all need to learn to read and write and reach a base level for each intelligence. And yet, of course, we are going to have varying degrees of each of the intelligence. So my question for you is, what's your sense of when a young person should be allowed to start specializing in the intelligences that are coming most naturally to them and about which they feel most passionate? Well, I mean, that, certainly that varies by kid, that's by definition, but I think early is good. Um, what I would argue, and I wrote a, uh, wrote a chapter for a book that was published in China a few years ago, what I would argue that is, is that as parents, we have a, a, an obligation to expose our kids to all intelligences. And, and here's why I say that first. Too often what I, what I think happens is we as adults have our own intelligence. Everybody has an intelligence profile. 
when we adults have our intelligence profile and we channel the kids into the things that we're trying mm. to know. So if we're an artist, we probably take our kids to the museum a whole lot. If we're bodily kinesthetically talented, our kids are going to be playing sports. Well, well there, there's merit in that and anything that puts kids and parents together, I'm all for. But I would argue that particularly at the early years, particularly until a kid is eight or nine, you want to make sure that kid gets exposed to lots of different intelligences. Um, and I would say that one of the things you do, you've got this list of the eight intelligences, and you check off where have we gone? Have we gone to the zoo? Have we gone to the art museum? Have we gone to the symphony? And give your kid that opportunity. And then what's going to happen is interest will take over. I've got a, uh, a nephew who's six years old and he's really into hockey. Well, he's going to be a good hockey player. One of the reasons he's really into hockey, not to take anything away from him, is his dad's really into hockey. And that's wonderful, comma, but his parents also take him to museums. They also go hiking. So I think the key thing as a parent is to give your kid exposure. And if that passion arises, it will manifest itself and you'll see that. Now, having said that, we probably all are old enough to know kids who at age or nine were zealots about this. And by 18 or 19, they've totally forgotten it. So it seems right. to me providing an exposure and then cultivating, and then the kid will take the lead. Hmm. What about in this for, in, in terms of formal education? And I'll give you an example of, of, um, of a case here that I think applies. So we've been, my, my team and I have been making this video on musical intelligence and we're featuring a young artist by the name of Billie Eilish. And you may have heard of her. She's becoming extremely well known and is quite talented and she works she collaborates with her brother and they're bo both brilliant musicians she's a vocalist and he's a sort of versatile musician um, but the reason I bring her up is she was homeschooled her and her brother were homeschooled and when they started showing like extreme interest in music the parents allowed them to really spend the majority of their time of creating music and just kind of playing around with music and they would even say to them like you don't even have you don't have a, you don't have to have a bedtime if you're working on your music you can stay up as late as you want and so I, I, I'm sure if you were to look at the, like the literal time spent on the various subjects they would have had a huge majority of that spent on musical intelligence where if they had been in a traditional school they would have had to probably go to bed early to wake up and get there on time. They would have had to spend the same amount of time with each subject as every other kid. And inevitably their times developing musical intelligence would have gotten much shorter. And I'm sure it would have, they would have ended up, you know, becoming highly talented musicians, but maybe even a little bit later. So mm -hmm. that, that's an example um, of, a child really being allowed in their formal education to really spend the majority of their time focusing on the intelligence. So, you know, I guess, let me ask it this way. There really isn't until the third year of college that a, a student can primarily focus on what they're interested in. And in high school, there's a little bit of room for electives, but it's very limited. And, and then in the typical middle school and elementary school, it's, it's a relatively um, templated experience for each kid. So if you could, not to, not to, you know, not that it's this black and white, but if you could kind of choose a, an age or a grade where you think there should be way more um, opportunity to personalize than there currently is, what would you say? Let me, let me give you two thoughts on that. And the first one would be, and the, the woman you're describing sounds like a wonderful trajectory, and I'm sure, sure she'll be successful, semicolon, however, comma, I'm traditional enough that I want to make sure everybody has a three R's. I mean, I'm a multiple intelligence this kind of a guy, but I worry if a kid graduates from our schools without having the requisite skills. Um, I would argue, in fact, that the pervasiveness of email and texting makes the ability to write the written word even more important mm. because it's so much more rare these days. So my first thought is the academics have to be there. My second thought though, Nick, and, and I hear what you're saying about the channeling and the opportunity, I would suggest though that you get a different answer if you don't limit yourself to 8.30 to 3.30. And it seems to me that uh, I use 
eight or nine years old a little earlier. And I think there comes an age where if you're a parent, it's really obvious. And that's one of the things that you can cultivate on weekends, after school, evenings, or whatever. Kids who are passionate are going to find a way. And again, I'm enough of a traditionalist. This woman's story sounds great, but I worry about somebody who has put all their eggs in the musical, the spatial, the bodily kinesthetic basket, and in fact, then becomes 18 and has trouble finding a job and making a livelihood. Fair, totally fair. Yeah, and perhaps that that general baseline that we were talking about that a person needs to reach with all of the intelligences should be pretty high. You know, mm -hmm. I suppose it's fair to say that we should all become um, totally proficient writers and readers, even if our, spe our specialty is elsewhere. So yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and let me add on that if I might. I've been talking a lot about the personal intelligences and social emotional learning. And it seems to me that a, a danger, and I'm not pushing it against it, but a danger in letting a kid channel too much is that she may not learn grit because she's doing well at something. Uh, many artistic endeavors and athletic endeavors aren't really team sports, they're more individual. And what I want, what I know now as an old guy, I've come to value social emotional learning. Uh, character a great deal. I want people who can work in a situation, work with people who are different than they are, who can appreciate them, who can empathize, who can do their best work. To me, that's the most important thing we can prepare kids to do in the world because we don't know what the world is going to be tomorrow. Makes sense. I have one thought and one question. The thought is, I hear you on um, the grit point, although I would push back a little bit and say that I, I think it, it is possible that a child finds success in something and then they just kind of want to focus on that because it comes easily to them and therefore they don't have to really chant, like cultivate grit. But I also think that when a person finds something that they're very good at, they tend to push themselves to the edge of what's possible with that. And at the edge is where grit becomes important to keep expanding that. So I, I do think that it's it's quite possible, and I know in myself, and as I have found things that I am good at, I've like pushed myself to the limit, and I've really found grit because the potential for how high the ceiling is is like very inspiring for me. So I do I do think that you know even if a child is something is coming easily to the child that they can still find a way to um, dig deep and find grit and push themselves. And that will look like they're going far beyond the average person, which, which I suppose is, is great. Um, and then the question is, um, let me think for a second. Oh yeah, about grit. When, so what would you say? Well, how would you advise either an individual or like a parent of a student or a teacher of a student who just would maybe even describe themselves as lazy? Like they can't, they don't have grit. How would you guide someone? Well, let me give you a larger answer to that. <clears throat> a book I wrote about four years ago was called The Formative Five. And basically I identified five success skills. These are the social emotional qualities that I think kids need to be successful in the real world. And I talked about empathy, self-control, integrity, embracing diversity and grit. And the reason why I give you that, that preface there is that my attitude and the attitude of my faculty was that we could begin working on those as young as kindergarten. Now you're gonna work on it very differently with the kid who's five than the kid who's 15, but it can be worked on. Uh, when we began talking about grit, for example, on a Friday, I said to all the teachers, what I'd like you to do is ask your kids to use some grit over the weekend and report on it on Monday. And it was interesting, one of the kindergarten teachers talked about how the, kid, how the kids told her how they had used grit. Now, their definition, their criteria weren't as, as sophisticated, obviously, as in older kids, but they talked about not quitting in a soccer game. They talked about being, being tired and not giving up. So it seems to me all of those qualities can be developed. Um, I gave a presentation a couple nights ago on social emotional learning. And I said, and this is for your audience right now, I said to the parents, this was um, Tuesday night, that I think an opportunity we often overlook is the role models that parents can be. And I talked with that group a lot about the dinner table discussions. 
Uh, if you want your child to be empathic, which you do, then you make a point of not only asking, how did you do in school today? Uh, what were the latest test scores? You find a way to ask, who did you help today? Who were you kind? What kind act did you see? And by framing the discussion at the dinner table, by framing what we reinforce, it can change what kids value. Uh, another piece on that, my, with my work at the university, again, I said I visit schools. And the good news is that when I visit schools, grade schools, high schools, middle schools, most of the time when I walk through the halls, there's a ton of kids work up, lots of artwork, lots of academic papers. The not so good news is that if you take the time to look at it, most of that work represents the top 20% of the kids. It's great art, it's A papers, it's really good stuff. And my point is always, hold on a second, what about the kids who didn't make it to the wall? What can you do? It's not to say that the fine stuff shouldn't be there, but I would argue that a faculty, a teacher should be saying, how can I motivate everybody? Uh, there's a school in St. Louis, there's a wonderful principal named Casey Seals. She's the principal of the Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis, St. Louis Public School. And I was at her school a couple of years ago and there was a plaque in the hall about yay big, uh, you know, 18 inches by two feet. And it lists the greatest attendance gains for the second semester. And the first girl's name says plus 8%. Now, it doesn't say what that means. I doubt that it's 88 to 96. It could be 50 to 58 or 68 to 76, whatever. But what this principal has done is say, I'm going to reward these kids. I'm going to reinforce them. So she's working on increasing their responsibility, their grit, if you will, by saying, hey, look how much better you did. So when you, when you ask the question, at what age, I think we can begin it at an early age. And I think if you're parents, you've got great opportunities. I always say, I'm an educator, I'm a school guy, but as important as schools are, parents are more important. And so you've got an opportunity by what you talk about, what you discuss, what you reward, what you model. Um, grit, when I talk about that, one of the things I'll say, I have 100 educators, I'm in a school giving a presentation or a conference, and I'll say to the educators, raise your hand if within the past month you went to school some morning this is before COVID. You went to school some morning and you had a headache, you didn't sleep well, you were up with a sick child, you took the dog to the vet, you had an argument with your spouse, whatever, you were really cranky. Well, everybody raises their hand. So hands down, say, now, raise your hand if you shared that with your class. Nobody raises their hand. And the case I make to them is that you have an opportunity here not to complain to your kids about your spouse or your child, but to let them know that you're smiling, but guess what? You really had to work hard. This didn't come easily. When I watched the uh, gymnastics, I think, wow, I could never do that. Well, first of all, I could never do that. But secondly, I forget that they spent 20,000 hours. And it seemed to me as adults at the dinner table at night, too often we talk about our successes. We don't talk about how hard we work. We may talk about a good presentation we did. Kids need to know all the time you spent preparing that when they were asleep in bed at night. So it's never too early, it's never too late to really frame what we believe is important and work on that. Yes, I think that's a great point. And I mean, it's, it's psychology 101 to understand that behavior that gets rewarded tends to get repeated. And so I, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. Finding creative ways to reward grit is a great point. Yeah, yes. and, and the reward isn't, isn't a sticker or a piece of candy. The reward is kids intrinsically feeling good because mm. they're, they're doing the right thing that's valued. Mm. Yes, and I, just adding on to this, I think it's, it's so important to celebrate effort even more than we celebrate success. Like I would give the example of, um, let's say you're a basketball coach and you know you have a player shoot a really bad shot like and they just get lucky and make it i would celebrate the really good shot in a really good position with really good timing that a kid misses more than i would celebrate the bad shot that luckily goes in Absolutely. i think so i just think that's really important and, and relates to what you're saying is celebrating signs of effort even more than we celebrate the outcome of that process okay. And to back up to the to MI and the personal intelligences, I said earlier, I think a couple times, that we believe that the personal intelligence is the most important. Well, we believe intrapersonal is the key intelligence because mm -hmm. if you know 
your strengths, your weaknesses, then you can know what you need to work on, where you need to improve, and how you can excel. And so one of the ways we cultivate that is we would have kids reflect on how well they had prepared for something and then reflect on how well they did. If you did well, why was it? What could you have done differently? Um, I've got a great photo and a presentation I use of fourth graders, different fourth grade class, building Greek temples. And what the kids did was work in a team of four. And they had studied Greek architecture, studied democracy. They were given construction paper, staples, paste, all that stuff to build them. But before they did it, the teacher said, this is not really a lesson about building Greek temples and architecture. It's really a lesson about teamwork. So before we break into teams, let's talk as a class. What does it mean to be a good team member? What are the qualities? And from that, she generated qualities that the kids were able to cite. This is somebody who listens well, somebody who takes responsibility. And she created a rubric that listed these are the qualities of a good teammate. And they actually had points. This is when somebody shows a little, shows a lot, and so forth and so on. So the class generated that. She had it hung up on the wall where they could all see it. And then the first day they worked, and at the end of that, she stopped and she had them pull out the sheet they had put on their desk and asked them to reflect on how they did. Judge yourselves on what kind of a good teammate you are. Hey, that's interpersonal working with others. Mm. It's intrapersonal knowing yourself. They did it on the second day, and the second day they talked about it as a team. And then the third day, it was a three-day project. They came up with a team grade for how they were as a team. And again, what we're doing here is trying to help kids develop the kinds of skills that are going to help them in the work setting and in life. Whether they I love to that. In the home, right? It's, it's teaching them very consciously, formally. And Nick, as you know, uh, people who are successful kind of do these things. Too many people don't because they've never had an opportunity. They've never been shown. They've never learned. And we're saying everybody can be successful. We're going to give them the tools. That's beautiful. I, I, I love that so much even like the specific example because most people can relate to the experience of doing small group work in school and the dynamics of the small group are detached from the actual assignment usually and often most people can relate to wow like there's always that one person who like doesn't really do anything and the other people have to pull their weight so the question of how were you how am i as a teammate is just so good, you know? And honestly, throughout all the small group work I've ever done in my schooling, I've never been asked to reflect on that question. Uh, some teachers have asked me to reflect on like, how were the other team members? How do they contribute? But the personal reflection there, the intrapersonal reflection is just super important and frankly might resolve that issue to some degree of individuals not contributing enough because if I had to kind of have this really honest with reflection with myself and realize like I really didn't do much and I relied on them and I wasn't communicating well and all that, that might be corrective in itself. So mm -hmm. I, I love that very much. And I couldn't agree more that it completely translates to one's profession. I mean, basically any profession, even if it's mostly a sort of isolated process, we're always dealing with people. We're always having to reflect on ourselves. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you, and you kind of have answered it, but I'll let you add if you want to, which is just, why do you uh, have a bias toward the personal intelligences? You well, the, 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 the saying that I've been using now, and I used it in my last two books, is that we need to be preparing kids for success in life, not success in school. Uh, and we need to prepare them to succeed in school. Again, absolutely. But if you talk about preparing kids for life, it changes the horizon. Um, when I give presentations at conferences, uh, I'll have a couple opening questions. One of those, again, is are there differences between success in school, success in life? And it's amazing. The educators all say, absolutely, there are. They know that. And then I'll say, to what degree does your curriculum reflect that? Well, it doesn't because we're still preparing kids for the end of the semester, uh, end of high school, whatever. The other question I'll ask that you'll get a kick out of, I suspect, is I'll say to people, um, think back for a minute to who was the smartest person in your high school graduation class. And I'll give people a minute, you know, they're thinking, and I'll have them turn, and I'll say, was that an easy or a hard question? Well, if it was an easy question, it's because you remember who walked across the stage, who was a valedictorian. 
If it's a hard question, it's because now you've looked back and you realize how people succeed that wasn't tied into school. So to me, when we prepare kids for success in life, not simply success in school, of course we're going to focus on the personal intelligences. Uh, as I said, I'm working on a book now about empathy. The title of it is The Principal as CEO colon Chief Empathy Officer. And the argument I'm making here is that by leading with empathy, you develop people, you run a different kind of a school. And I think we as educators have an obligation to help our kids and our faculty members all develop all of the formative five. And again, those are what Howard Gardner calls the personal intelligences. Can you say again what those formative five are? Sure, sure. I begin with empathy, self-control, integrity, embracing diversity, and grit. Empathy, integrity, self-control, embracing diversity, and grit. Mm. I'll have to read this book. That's, yeah, those are essential. Well, if you do you find a typo, uh, let me know. <laughs> I'm sure your editors are good. I'll catch it all. <laughs> um, on the note of, I, I just have a, like two more questions for you. I, I know we're like somehow an hour is, we're approaching the hour mark. So a couple more questions though, um, regarding embracing diversity in particular and the importance of diversity in the learning environment. Um, I know that you've talked about at the New City School, there was uh, at least 40% of students were of color. And I'm not sure what the demographics are in the particular region of St. Louis you were in and whether that was like reflective or not. But, but basically, I can tell that you know that that's important, that kids are learning with a wide diversity of other kids. And so I'm just curious, why do you think that that's important? Well, a couple of things. Yeah, St. Louis is primarily a, a black and white community, and, and that was reflected mostly in our school. <clears throat> Having said that, when I give presentations about the formative five, which I do quite a bit, I've got a slide and I talk about embracing diversity. And then the next slide shows the different kinds of diversities. Because what I found is that when I began doing this, folks naturally here in the U.S. immediately reverted to diversity being race. Mm. Uh, that certainly is a, a topic for us now. Uh, I can look at people and, and gauge probably what race they are. But on my next slide, I have icons that look at religion, sexual orientation, age, disability, um, socioeconomic status, academic achievement, and even politics, because there's lots of diversities. Mm -hmm. And the case I would make, again, coming back to, if we're preparing kids to succeed in life, however diverse our world is today, it's going to be more diverse tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we have done our kids a disservice if we haven't helped them understand how to embrace other people. When I talked about the formative five and I gave you those terms, you may have noticed that diversity is the only one that's preceded by an adverb, embracing. And that's because years ago when I was formulating these, I wanted people to know that this is really important. Uh, you can't say, well, my kid has grit, my kid's empathetic, I don't worry about diversity. That's something you have to embrace. Uh, the new book on which I'm working now, as I said, I'm going to go beyond embracing diversity and I'm talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it seems to me that any kid who grows up who is less than comfortable, that is un unable to appreciate and value and embrace other people because of differences, that kid really loses. And my goal is to help every child be successful in life, however that success is defined. So being able to embrace diversity is an important part of that. And we need to formally work on that as our curriculum. You mentioned that we were 40% uh, kids of color, and we were. And when I talk, still are. And when I talk with people about that, I say having a good mix, having a good percentage is only the starting point. What's really important are the kinds of experiences you give kids. And we're, and we're running out of time, but I'll just say also, we embrace diversity enough that we not only work at it with our students, we work at it with our parents. Because one of the things we noted was that at the soccer games and t-ball games, our kids of different races were much more comfortable, it appeared to us, with one another than sometimes their parents were. Well, their parents are older, they may have grown up, lived, worked in more segregated communities. So we consciously tried to work on activities and experiences which would help our parents of different diversities 
come to understand, work, and embrace one another as well. Mm. Yeah, interesting. You know, and what's just just a general comment on the state of our of our nation. <clears throat> I mean, I think the the world or the, the country is more segregated than most people understand. And there's a really good there's something called the racial dot map which was developed by sociologists who just simply put a dot on the map of the US representing each person, representing them by color as well. Like, so there's a blue dot representing black folk and a red dot representing Asian folk and so on. There's a, there's a whole key there. But when you see that bird's eye view, mm -hmm. you see super clearly that in many regions, we are like starkly segregated and to me, it's like, it's just an interesting thing to reflect on because obviously the reasons for that are rooted in deeply unethical practices, right? Like Jim Crow and redlining and um, things and manipulative economics and things like that. Um, but, and so now here we are with the results of all that. And I think there's, there's something to embracing like embracing diversity would might might even include seeking it and yes. it's kind of a delicate thing because it's not like you're going to go out and reach out to people because they're of a different ethnicity and it's not like will you be my friend because you're indian and i don't have many indian friends like that's silly of course but to just really put ourselves in situations in places where there's a great diversity of people just to increase that chances of developing relationships and at least being exposed to people who are of different subcultures so seeking yeah. experiences and and nick in case that in case this your, your readers are really intrigued by this you wisely mentioned the historical vestiges of that there's a great book called the color of law by richard rothstein and what what he does is look at the role that federal state and local governments have played in our country and segregation mm. and this didn't end obviously you know 50 years ago and he goes statute by statute looking at that and it's really very sobering and when you read that it's real clear why we are in the problem we are today and your point is a good one um i would argue that we have government responses that need to fix it but the bottom line is we all need to be active in seeking and valuing diversity mm. uh this whole political scene has exacerbated our differences and we each have to fight against that in our own way and work to get to know and respect other people even though we may not agree with them hmm. well said okay well while i sense that this conversation could go on for like days um i guess as we approach the end of our scheduled time together i would love to just ask you the question that is a more personal question we all have all of the intelligences everyone who studies this theory understands that and we also understand that we tend to have them at varying degrees and that sometimes a couple of them or a few of them may be particularly prominent in a person so i'm wondering what intelligences do you find are your biggest strengths well um you're right that we all have an mi profile that's the term we used at new city school um i think i'm probably strong linguistically because I've written half a dozen books and hundreds of articles. Um, I'd like to say that I'm interpersonally strong, but my guess is people who know me would roll their eyes and say not as much as you think. Um, in, in Trump personally, hopefully I am. Um, I know that I'm not nearly as strong bodily and aesthetically as I would like. I've got a buddy with whom I play basketball and he beats me every time. And I always convince myself that it's a lot. So that speaks to my lack of bodily kinesthetic and intrapersonal. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, it makes, makes sense. Let me ask you this too, actually, quickly, just speaking of the MI profile, I think that's such an, first of all, an enjoyable exercise, you know, for people to just reflect on what is my MI profile. I think it can maybe, I mean, I'm not aware, is there a, clear kind of standardized way to um, figure that out? Do you know? Well, there's a guy named Branton Shearer who invented the MIDAS, M-I-D-A-S, I'm sure you can Google it, which is a self, 
in my scoring, if you will. Um, but again, it's a self-scoring. To me, and your question said a bit differently, I would often hear from parents, um, what are my kids' strongest intelligences? And they would ask us, did we note that on the child's report card? No, we didn't. Um, but I say that you, the way you can really find out your strongest intelligence is by looking at how you spend your time. Because mm. um, we, we choose to do, again, the things that we like, the things that were enjoyable. Uh, to back up a few minutes, chances are I'm linguistically somewhat talented because I spend most of my day reading and writing. And, uh, you know, I keep Amazon in business just with the books I buy. So if you look at how people spend their time, you're going to know in which intelligence is their response. Mm. Yeah, that's that's helpful and very practical and something that everyone listening can apply and reflect on. Okay. Wow. Well, I have such a sincere appreciation for you as a person and the work that you've done and um, just how how like genuine your intentions are, which I sense. Well, Nick, that's kind of and I just have to say I was far I I was fortunate. A Howard Gardner has been a friend, a supporter. Uh, his conceptualization started me and us on this journey. And then I was fortunate to work with an incredible faculty. I mean, I taught before I was a school leader and I thought I was a good teacher. And then I would walk in classroom after classroom and be in awe at what these people were doing. So thank you. And, and I'm here in a way representing all of their talents and all of their energy. Mm. Beautiful. Well, maybe our paths will cross again. I hope so. And thank you so much for your time today. Good, thank you. Uh, this was fun. I agree. All right. What a what a fun conversation. Well, you you know you ask good questions, and it's a it's an important issue. So hopefully, uh, folks will get energized and do some of the things that we suggested. Right. Right. I think so. I know that. You know, I, I teach psychology at community colleges, as I mentioned to you, and, and this is always, of course, one of the one of the, the topics, you know, intelligence in general, but this one in particular. And that's, yeah, I think you've really offered valuable things that people are typically curious about regarding the theory, you know, like, how would it really look to start applying this more in real life? And how can I develop and figure out which ones I have? And so you just gave very concrete you know, responses to that. And I appreciate that. Well, and at some point in the future, when you're, when you're cycling and you're looking, I'd be happy to come back and talk about, we talked about servant leadership uh, earlier, Mindy Beer, who's a colleague of mine, that sort of thing. I could talk about social emotional learning and the principal as the CEO. I mean, uh, I'm all for spreading the word. Mm. Well, I'm happy that we've been able to do that today. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.